Uh, Paul, I think with that lead in, I'm, I'm actually going to segue to you in terms of talking about um, uh, HR committees and some of the things that, um, you know, according to Paul, they should be doing and, uh, and could be doing. Um, okay, thanks, Don. Um, I, uh, I, um, I want to cover two points, uh, and I want to come at the thing a little differently than uh, uh, Heather and, uh, and Sue have, uh, because they have brought us uh, the perspective of how things are, uh, ought to be done uh, if you have all the resources that are available to, to you to do them. And I'd just like to make some comments in respect of smaller companies and how they approach this and how they rank their priorities. Um, I think it won't be a surprise to some of uh, our uh, watchers or listeners uh, out there that uh, uh, I have a view that uh, we're going in the wrong direction uh, as we uh, increasingly ask uh, boards of directors to provide uh, oversight over a much broader range of issues uh, and that's being driven by uh, the regulators, by the governance gurus, uh, and by the practitioners who uh, all benefit by uh, increasing the obligations on the board of directors. And uh, my view has been that uh, the uh, growth of oversight has been so large that uh, the uh, benefits that could be derived from oversight are actually getting diminished. And I noticed, Don, in, uh, in your book, you've got under the agenda page this concept that we've introduced of uh, insight and oversight. And I think that's a magic division that uh, we need to address. And the idea is that oversight is the things that the board must do. And insight is the things where the board members, on the basis of their uh, wisdom, can provide advice to management in terms of what the management might do. So for those of you who are operating smaller uh, institutions and are wondering what the role of the board, and particularly the Human Resources Committee, uh, ought to be in terms of those things that uh, are uh, oversight, the things that the board must do, uh, I actually take the list down to three, or if you want to add the things that the regulator ha says you have to do, down to four. So leaving the regulator aside, uh, I think that uh, the Board Human Resources Committee obviously must make the decisions in terms of hiring and firing the Chief Executive Officer. Secondly, I think that the uh, Board must make plans for, uh, for the contingency uh, of um, uh, your Chief Executive Officer and a bus meeting each other in the middle of the room uh, with the probability that the bus uh, will have, uh, will be, will come out of that uh, in a little better shape than your chief executive officer. Uh, and so emergency succession plans need to be in place so that you know what to do if uh, the bus hits, if the plane crashes, and uh, you are sitting there without a chief executive officer for a short or long period of time. And then thirdly, I think that the board must make the decisions relating to the compensation of the chief executive officer and the executive and management, uh, and the executive management. And I'll come back to that in a minute. But if those are the things that the board uh, must do, then I think uh, all of the other things that uh, we've discussed today are things that the board should do, uh, or they are things that the board could do. And if I had uh, my druthers, I'd knock all the things that the board could do off the list and restrict myself to those things that the board should do. And then I would need to say, how will I decide what are the things that the board should do? Well, um, if, you, uh, if you take the whole field of human resources and you abstract it, to its highest level of generality, uh, I would say that the whole discussion falls into three buckets. Quality of work, uh, quality of life, and quality of pay. And all of the subjects that we discuss are subjects that fall into one of those three buckets. And so I would say that what a board of directors might do in the context of the human resource function 
is the same thing that we've asked the board to do in the context of risk management. We've asked the board to come up with a risk management statement, uh, a I'm sorry, a risk appetite statement that talks about what the appetite of the board is. So I say, why doesn't the board come up with a human resource appetite statement uh, in the context of quality of work, quality of life, and quality of pay, and set out a general framework which would allow management to then uh, operate within that framework as it approached these broader issues. So if I were looking at the should-dos rather than the could-dos, I would say that they represent those things that are important to the organization over the span of a chief executive officer's um, term in office, which these days is what? Is it less than four years now is the average term of office of a chief executive officer? So those things that might be within that framework. And uh, I was going to uh, identify this concept of a human resource appetite statement as one of those kinds of things. But listening to Heather today, I think that another of those kinds of things would be uh, this issue of changing technology. That is such a huge issue that has such long-term uh, implications for the organization as a whole that it's another kind of issue that needs to be thought about by the board in this framework. So that's how I would do that. Um, the other area that I wanted to cover, Don, is I wanted to talk a bit about, the, uh, about making the decisions relating to the compensation of the chief executive officer and the management. And the reason that uh, I uh, wanted to talk about that is that uh, another of uh, the violins that I play um, is that uh, I think that uh, we've gone overboard, uh, generally speaking, in terms of the demands for expertise that we're placing on the board. Uh, I think that uh, the demands for expertise um, create real problems, first of all, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, reducing the decision-making power of management, which is where the real expertise lies. Uh, you only have to listen to Susan for a uh, few minutes as she makes her presentation. You say, oh man, this is really a field for experts. And how the board could ever achieve the kind of expertise to give oversight to Susan is beyond me. However, they might be able to give her insight on the basis of uh, their kinds of experience. Having said that I'm uncomfortable with expertise generally across the board, I do think that in the field of uh, compensation for the CEO and the, and the management committee, that the, comp that the Human Resource Committee at least needs to have uh, compensation literacy, if not compensation expertise. And the reason that I think that is unlike virtually everything in the else in the organization, management and the board are of one mind working towards the same objectives. In the absence of fraud, even in the audit committee, management and the board all have the same objectives in mind. But in the context of compensation, we have an honest, fair enough conflict of interest because the, human, because the management does have an interest in the compensation of management and it isn't necessarily, it isn't necessarily consistent with the best interests of the shareholders. And so in order to have a balance on that kind of thing, the Human Resources Committee needs to have sufficient literacy to be able to talk to people who they retain, such as Ken and his company, and be able to have a articulate, thoughtful, and intelligent conversation about compensation, which they can then deal with in terms of bargaining between the Human Resource uh, Committee and the senior management of the board. So in all my views about expertise elsewhere, my particular exception is, the, uh, is uh, if not expertise, then at least literacy. Uh, on the uh, board of the Human Resources Committee in respect of the compensation function. So those were the two points that I had wanted to make now and uh, 
I'll throw myself over, we can turn the seasoned executive over on the other side and uh, probe. I still have some seasoning to go to respond to all those points, Paul, but um, uh, what I would say, that it was an interesting uh, commentary around uh, expertise on the board because uh, quite honestly, every issue that's popped up, the response has been to gear up the, the expertise on the board. Um, certainly think about the risk committee, well we need to have a risk expert uh, on the committee. Uh, on the audit committee, it's been literacy, but you know now they're talking about audit quality and putting an auditing expert onto the committee. So that seems to be kind of the, the standard response uh, that's been there. So it's been interesting to hear your commentary that perhaps that is going too far in terms of in terms of boundaries. Well, I think we're engaged in a Sisyphusian exercise here. You remember that was the guy who was trying to roll the stone up the hill, and every time he tried to roll it up the hill, it rolled down. Uh, the hill again, uh, and uh, the tragedy of uh, Sisyphus is that uh, he never really understood that it wasn't his job to roll that stone up the hill, even though it kept rolling down the hill again. <laughs> and I think that that's the path we're on with this business of adding more and more experts to the board. And notwithstanding that, we still have failure after failure after failure. And maybe the answer is to give the responsibility back to management to actually make the decisions and leave the board with a narrower oversight role and a wider insight role. That's, uh, but quite, perhaps I digress uh, again. Uh, quite a picture to paint of the, <laughs> of the stone come back, Ken. Well, uh, just on uh, Paul's second point, I wanted to comment. Uh, we actually uh, pr predictably completely agree with the need for expertise uh, on the board and on the committee on exec comp. I was made to a joke a little earlier that perhaps all that should be outsourced and realize that sounds a tad self-interested. Uh, on a slightly more serious note, uh, we welcome and are much more comfortable when we are dealing with a chair of the committee who's obviously been there and done it, knows how comp systems work. It is much easier for us and the um, ability to, to get things done and get agreement is, is a lot easier than with someone who really doesn't uh, doesn't have much background in it, so I think that's a very good uh, suggestion. I'm not sure I agree with you, Paul, on the the absence of need on on accounting. It strikes me that having someone pretty smart to be able to, you know, interact with the um, uh, the auditor probably makes sense. I do want to make one other point in terms of the governance of the executive pay is that. Uh, often people will refer to pay for the CEO and senior officers as though it's one and the same. We actually don't believe that uh, And in terms of the governance process. Uh, in our view, the CEO review, uh, doing a contract when you're hiring or promoting or any of these, is done by the committee and recommended to the board. And it, typically the committee does need some expertise and it should avail itself of that expertise. We do not think that the, the committee or its advisor should be making the recommendations as to how anyone else is paid. And it, it may seem a subtle distinction, but we think it's really important that uh, the CEO is the person who working with the, their HR department and be, you know they can work with us mm -hmm. if, if our client's comfortable or they may work with another firm. Uh, they have to generate the proposals and we will respond. And you know it's a, a good interactive back and forth but I think committees step into very dangerous ground if they begin uh, doing part of their CEO's job and uh, setting pay for people who report to the CEO. Bad move in our view. Yeah, I'm just thinking about, uh, we have a very broad audience um, today. A lot of the discussions in terms of the, you know, must do, should do, could do, uh, maybe makes sense in a large organization with lots of resources uh, established well down the journey uh, as, a, as opposed to smaller organizations. So Paul, I think your commentary worked quite nicely in terms of what should be done in a smaller organization. And maybe I'd just like to you know, hear from our panelists in terms of, let, put yourself in the shoes of a small cap or, or a NPO or a Crown Corp and, and, and some of the advice you might give them to deal with sort of these issues. In a not-for-profit, uh, often uh, the expertise is on the board, not uh, in the uh, management. The people on the not-for-profit board are often ones who've committed their, their, their lives to whatever it is that the organization is doing, knows everything about it, and 
and then when it gets out of hand for to do on a volunteer basis, they bring in people to be the management and to be the chief executive officer. And um, and my uh, my enthusiastic comments uh, in the context of not-for-profit organizations ought to be molded to take into consideration uh, how those organizations come to pass. Are there any last words of advice for, for this, this group of organizations? Yeah, so I, I think for small businesses, um, uh, you know, even if you're small, uh, what is going to stall your growth or impact um, your results is going to be the quality of your leadership and talent. And so, you know, obviously you can't do some of the things that I talked about, um, but you can, um, you know, ask for exposure to the people that you're betting your company on and the people that you're relying on to deliver that growth or to deliver uh, on your business plan and strategy. And so, you know, very simply, you need to know uh, who the CEO is relying on in order to execute against that business plan and understand um, the quality of that bench if you don't have the ability to do some of the other things that I talked about. So there's some things to be uh, thinking about in terms of smaller organizations and how you apply these from, uh, from uh, larger organizations with uh, much more resources. 